so um, I've been working on this for a few days and today has been one of those days and um, after working on it in a lot more depth today I didn't transfer the new one onto my USB before I ran out of the office so I'm very much relying on the Holy Spirit <laughs> to help me remember what I put in the presentation and yeah, I just hope to share with you something about the work that we do in SPEC Scotland and um, just to give you an overview of that. I won't go into any of the issues that we work with in any great depth, but just an overview and also just to talk to you about um, some of the things that you can do. And I'm glad that question came up earlier. What can, what can we do as kind of ordinary people? I know I work for the pro-life movement, but I did a lot of work um, aside from this as a volunteer beforehand. And so just to maybe talk through with you and hopefully give you some ideas about what you can do um, to get involved with SPEC Scotland and the issues um, in general. So <clears throat> let's hope this works. So just to talk, I don't know how many of you know um, SPC well or know um, how it's run and what the aims are, but I'll just go over briefly um, what the aims of the society are and why it was established. Um, so it was set up in 1967 in response to the passing of the Abortion Act, so that was its initial aim was to um, respond to this and to, to help to make abortion illegal again after it was legalised. So that was its first aim. And in general, it was set up to affirm, to defend and promote the existence and value of human life from the moment of conception until natural death. So although initially the focus was on abortion solely, now we're working in many different issues, um, especially just now with euthanasia, with embryo research, with IVF, with the marriage campaign as well. So all these different issues, anything, and anything especially affecting life from conception, so the, the child in the womb and right up until the person who's vulnerable at the end of their life and what we can do to protect them when they're vulnerable at this stage as well. <clears throat> so to reassert, also to reassert the principle laid down in the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of the Child that the child needs special safeguards and care including appropriate legal protection before as well as after birth. To defend, assist and promote the life and welfare of mothers during pregnancy and of their children from the time of conception up to, during and after birth. To examine existing or proposed laws, legislation or regulations relating to abortion and to support or oppose as appropriate. So the issues, we're both a political and a, an educational organisation, so we're involved in politics. The issues that we deal with politically are abortion, assisted suicide and euthanasia, and euthanasia and embryo research. In Scotland, we have a full-time education officer who goes around schools um, around Scotland and has access to a number of schools, both religious and non-denominational. And we've built up very good relations with schools throughout Scotland, thankfully. And we go back time and time again to cover all different ethical issues in the schools from primary school all the way through high school as well. And the issues that we look at in the schools are beginning of life, relationships, sexual health and end of life. So on the beginning of life one, we have two separate presentations, one on abortion and one on prenatal development, so the school can choose um, either of these. So what's important to know is that internationally agreed human rights support the pro-life position. The European Convention on Human Rights states in Article 2 that everyone's right to life shall be protected by law. In the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, everyone has the right to recognition everywhere as a person before the law. And then interestingly, um, in the UN Declaration of the Rights of the Child, the child needs special safeguards, including appropriate legal protection before as well as after birth. So as someone was talking about um, the rights of the child in the womb, obviously it's stating here that the child does deserve appropriate legal protection, but this is obviously... Um, this is not carried out, it's not, this law isn't, isn't held in place really, you could say. Um, so just an overview of the abortion facts in Scotland. In Scotland there are approximately 36 abortions take place every day. So that's 12,826 every year. 
and since the Abortion Act was passed, there have been 7.5 million abortion so when we do this talk in schools we say to the children to the pupils that basically the whole population and more of Scotland has been wiped out since the, the passing of the abortion act it, it really is a holocaust like it's incredible when you see the figure um, since the passing of the act so particular issues facing Scotland at the moment that we're working on is in our, Scot in our team in Scotland. You may have heard of the case which is in court at the moment um, with the two Scottish midwives who are fighting for their right to conscientious objection to be protected. <laughs> and that right is protected in the 1967 Abortion Act and it states that no person shall be under any duty, whether by contract or by any statutory or other legal requirement, to participate in any treatment authorised by this Act to which he has a conscientious objection. So bearing in mind that that is in the law, and these two midwives, they, they took this case to court, um, their supervisors in a maternity ward, and they were told that they would have to, to oversee abortions. And both of them, along with 10 other midwives, objected to this and said that they couldn't do it. The 10 midwives who weren't senior, they said, OK, that's fine, you don't have to do it. But the senior ones were challenged and they said, they, they pushed them, the, the NHS, and said that they would have to do it. So they took the case to court um, with the help of SPUC, who's funding the case. And the, they lost the court case um, this year initially, so they're, they're going back again with a second case and we'll take it to the UN if necessary. Um, but it's huge, um, the fact that, that obviously that, it's, that this is what it states in the law, that, that, our, that we have a right to conscientious objection and that their right has, has been denied already once in the court. So that's something to be very aware of just now, to keep in your prayers, to just to write to your MPs about, um, because it's very much under threat, not only for them, but for, for everyone, if, that was, if they were to lose the case again, and especially at the UN, if they were to lose the case, then that would have implications, huge implications on, on everyone and on medicine and the whole. Um, and the second thing, of course, that you're probably well aware of is the assisted suicide bill that um, Margot MacDonald is currently, again, she's getting ready to launch her second attempt to get this bill to be passed. And interestingly, it's called an end of life care bill. And um, I really don't think there's any place for the word care in the bill at all. It's just very clever language, obviously, because um, what, it, what it's doing is allowing people who are terminally ill or who are suffering to a degree that they cannot bear to end their lives with the help of a doctor. So it isn't at all about caring for the person, but about helping them to die, um, which isn't, it, is, it doesn't come under care at all. So that's just another issue that we are currently working. We're part of um, an alliance called the Care Not Killing Alliance. So SPEC is a part of that. So we work with different organizations and we're currently um, yeah, working to, to make sure that this this bill doesn't pass, but she's gearing up and she knows why it failed the first time. So she's going to definitely try even harder to look at all the areas in which it failed and to try and make sure that it does go through um, the second time. So another thing to be aware of, to, to please do write to your MPs about this and, and, and ask them what their views are and to, to stand up against this, this bill, which again will have huge implications uh, if it's passed in Scotland. Um, this is just typed up really quickly. In the presentation that I lost, um, I went into a lot more detail of just these are the three words that kind of stood out to me when I was thinking about, about this talk and about this presentation. And I went to a conference recently on euthanasia and these three things just kept jumping out at me personally um, in the, the word dignity. And that I think that people really have lost a sense of what it what dignity is because there's this whole it's so misused this term dignity and dignity in dying and they'll have an undignified death if they if we just leave them to die and to suffer and I did have the dictionary definition um, typed up and it was something like um, the state of being in which we're worthy of of respect and, and honor and I was thinking well why why is a person who is suffering 
why is a person who can't help themselves, who is in pain and who needs care, does that make that person not worthy of honour or not worthy of respect? And perhaps the person might feel like that, but what we're doing as a society and legalising euthanasia is to say, yeah, actually, we don't, we don't value you anymore. We don't, we don't uphold your dignity. We don't think, or we think that because you can't do anything anymore, give anything of yourself, that you just need cared for, that your life isn't worth living. And of course, that goes against our inherent dignity and our beliefs as, as a Christian that that God made us in his image and likeness and that our dignity doesn't depend on what we can do and what we can say on how we feel on our emotional physical capacity so I think when we're thinking about how to change things for the better we need to really be talking about this this word and this meaning of dignity to people that's certainly something that that I will that I would be doing personally with my friends or, or anything to say what well, what does it mean what does our dignity mean and especially at the times at the end of life um, and that we should be should be caring for people in whatever state that they're in not saying that their life isn't worthwhile anymore and that they should just die um, and suffering as well kind of falls into it people I think we've lost the sense of of what suffering means or our ability to cope with it and people are running away more and more and more from suffering and we're trying to escape it individually and as a society and this euthanasia bill is definitely trying to eliminate that as well and then suffering is then linked to, to care and compassion because if we don't have suffering then we don't need to, we don't need compassion there's no there's no because compassion is a response to someone who's in need who's suffering so you're eliminating you know the compassion of in your own heart and in society and so and care as well and I had another um, a quote from a young man who whose father suffers from locked in syndrome and he was talking about um, about the dignity of his father and saying that his father had a stroke and he was a very active man and he said it was very traumatic to see him suffer and to not be able to communicate anymore but that he still that he wanted to care for him, that he wanted to help him to live, and that he wanted to tell him that his life was worthwhile, and that he wished that the media would would speak about more of these cases of the people who do want to live, of the families who do want their these people, their family members who are ill to live, and it's a very biased situation that we're in that the media are focusing, you know, on particular cases like the Tony Nicholson one, and the Man Martin. Um, who are talking about wanting to die and there are two out of however many people you know all the rest of the people that we don't hear about who do still want to live and their, their voices aren't being heard and it's, it's very it's very worrying and um, that the media are pushing it from from that angle so yeah care and compassion um, suffering and dignity they're just kind of three things that stood out to me that uh, to think about and what do we think about these and yeah Okay, so <laughs> I quite like this quote. <laughs> it's bold, but um, <laughs> when I, I thought of it because um, I was talking to my brother about organising, we just organised the pro-life chain in Edinburgh at the weekend, and I was saying how stressed I was about trying to get people to come to this event, and how many people had pulled out at the last minute, and how it was probably just going to be me standing there. And it was, it was my brother who said to me, he said yeah, that this quote came to his mind, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. So this is mo obviously moving into the area of what can we do. Um, and s quite simply, I would say, just please do something. <laughs> just don't do nothing. That would be my plea for you tonight because a lot of people say to me, oh, that's great, you're doing that. You're so passionate about that. That's obviously your gift. You're working for the pro-life cause. So I'll just not do anything <laughs> because there are good people doing good things and that's true. Like, you know, I'm employed to do this work and I love doing it and I'm thankful that this is my job. But I did try to do everything that I could before I worked for SPUC, before I was employed by them and to do, you know, just the little things, whether it was just praying, going to an event, um, just keeping informed of the issues, but just making sure that we're doing something because I really believe that this is the biggest 
you know, the pro-life battle is the biggest battle that this world is facing just now with regards to abortion, euthanasia and all the issues and I think that we're definitely all called to do something and that we're all gifted in some way um, and that God can use each of us differently but we, ne we, need, to be, we need to be active um, and optimistic. <laughs> so what can you do? Um, so become an SPC member. <laughs> I actually have forms with me <laughs> so you could sign up. If you sign up to be an SPC member then it just means that we keep you informed of everything that we're doing and um, that we send you information every so often, all our campaigns, everything. If we're lobbying MPs on particular issues then we'll notify you about it. We'll even give you the draft letter so you can do it. So you're just kept informed of everything that's going on and if you've got any questions you can, you're basically in contact with us. Um, kept in the loop. Um, write to your local MPs, as I mentioned throughout. That's one, yeah, one of the things that we encourage most with our members is any time any of these issues come up. Um, even if you want to call us and say, do you have a letter ready? If you don't have time to write one, that's fine. We'll probably have one written already by one of our members or something, so we can circulate them. But yeah, to take, we, we find that writing letters are the most effective way of contacting the MPs and the way in which they listen. Um, the most to actually write, and they will write back, they have to write back. Um, so <laughs> um, start a pro-life group. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not saying that all of you could, if there is already a pro-life group, then you could, you could join one, but if you're at university or um, something, then, then please do think about it. If, or even if it's, a, I say pro-life group, but even if it's a, even if it's a prayer group, um, somebody was saying about the importance of prayer. Um, I, I would like to start a, a pro-life prayer group um, in Glasgow because I really feel uh, it's a hundred percent necessary, even for me to be able to do this work. That it has to be, it has to be rooted in, in prayer and led by by the Holy Spirit. So, um, if you feel able to, or even just to start a little prayer group in your house to pray every so often for it, then please do. Um, meet together, pray together, uh, discuss things. That's another thing, you know, that I would hope to do if I started the group is to just to discuss the issues and just to keep informed. And it's so much better when you're doing it in a group and with friends. And um, the, if you're at uni, um, which I know a couple of you are, we do have um, sort of a format of a life group that you can set up at university so we can help you with that and put you in touch with other universities where they have already have existing groups and things. <coughs> attend SPUC and other pro-life events. We have um, a conference every year and a youth conference every year and then in between that we have different days and, and pro-life chains and different activities throughout the year so please do if you can uh, come and support us at these events and we'll have a lot of different talks um, especially at the conferences and workshops which are really interesting and we'll keep you up to date again with everything that's going on. Be an every way witness, an everyday witness to the gospel of life, whether it's on Facebook. Facebook is probably where I spend 50% of my time. And just, you know, I just try to put little quotes, little articles, publish things um, that are promoting the gospel of life. So if you use Facebook, it's a really great way to spread the message, the pro-life message. Twitter, I don't really use Twitter, to be honest, but it's another good way, just among friends in conversation at university and at work to just be aware of trying to to bring this message to people in whatever circle you're in, in whatever way you can, really. If you, I've stole this from another pro-life website, <laughs> uh, from the website of Youth Defence, who are one of the most amazing pro-life organisations that I know. Um, if you are gifted in a particular area or have certain skills, public speaking, writing, design, video skills, law and advocacy, media, relations, fundraising, etc., then please lend us them and on our child, um, your talents, if you can do any of these things, because we're a very small team uh, in Glasgow, there are three of us on the team, and I certainly can't do all these things, so um, yeah, if you're good at anything in particular and feel drawn to, to give any of your time and your talents to, to this cause, then please get in touch with us and let us know. <clears throat> These are just some pictures that I put together <laughs> just to show you some of the things. They're mainly sort of youth <laughs> focused, but um, so these are just, this is um, a stall at a frenzy Christian concert. So we try to do stalls at events if we can just to promote our work, to give out merchandise. Um, 
conferences. I had a few more pictures, but I haven't got them. So this is just one of our youth conferences um, that takes place every year. So some pictures from um, on the top left. We went to a youth festival in Medjugorje. Um, in fact, three of them are from Medjugorje, and the Rally for Life is um, an event that takes place in Ireland run by this organisation, Youth Defence. Um, Franciscan Friars of, of the Renewal, I don't know if you know of this order, this is them in, in Medjugorje holding our pro-life revolution banner, so I thought that was quite a nice picture. <clears throat> this is um, our event on Saturday that I was talking about, the pro-life chain, um, and just to say a couple of words um, about that event, um, I don't know if you know, there was a, a big abortionist um, conference that took place in Edinburgh on Saturday, it's called the FIAPAC conference, it takes place every two years um, around Europe and so this year it just happened to be in Edinburgh so we tried to organise, well we did organise an event just to be outside the conference centre to witness um, to the pro-life message and initially we weren't given permission to be outside the conference centre but when we turned up on the Friday, well when I turned up everybody was already there and I ran over to the police and I said oh I'm sorry I know we're not supposed to be here, do you want us to move? Um, and he said no no it's fine you can stay here um, so that was fantastic. We were right outside the conference centre here for the whole time. They only allowed about 30 of us to be there. But what we were able to do then was to engage with the delegates themselves. And quite a few people throughout the day um, spoke to the abortionists themselves, which certainly was a first for me to witness. And most of the people who were doing it had never done so before. So it was, it was huge. It was challenging, but it was very, very blessed. And it was really fruitful. And not at all what you might have thought. There was no confrontation. There wasn't even a bad feeling in the air. The, the people respond, the abortionists and the delegates responded so well, as long as we approached them with love and compassion and just gentleness, um, which everybody did. And they were laughing and conversation. They were waving to us by the, you know, there was a lot of interaction and there were massive conversations that took place. So. Who knows what, what's happened through that, um, through people witnessing to them and interacting. And, and um, you can see that the youth defence, uh, some of the youth defence guys who flew over from Ireland to be there because they're, they're used to this kind of thing. And they're the ones who are basically keeping abortion out of Ireland. So they they're really are amazing witnesses. And it was great to have them there. And it's, it's joyful, you can see. <laughs> um, you know, it's joyful to do these things. It's great fun when you're in a group of pro-life people there should be joy <laughs> when you're there defending life. Um, there and the police even mentioned that. They said, you're the nicest group of people we've ever had to, um, to, to this was the protest police. And I was like, well, thank God we're giving off, you know, off good vibes because yeah, we should be happy when we're pro-life and doing this work. So that's it mainly um, from me. That's just a nice little picture at the end as well. Um, I've spoken for far longer than I thought I would, but thank you for listening and I don't know if you have any questions.